Okay. All right. Well, good morning and happy Friday. And it's ninth week, so just uh, one more week of lecture after this, and um, and then finals, and you, you know we're done for the uh, done for the quarter. Some of you, maybe I don't know. Uh, did, did anyone get my class next quarter? Okay, a couple of you, a few of you. I know, I know. It's tough. It's tough. So, um, so I'll see some of you next quarter. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just it, it fills it fills up quickly. But uh, but yeah, we'll um, let's take a look at today's lecture. So on uh, Wednesday, we introduced uh, bootstrap. Uh, non-parametric bootstrap and parametric bootstrap and the idea with bootstrap is you know we are well at least with non-parametric bootstrap we resample uh, our data with replacement and that's what that effectively does is it's we're basically saying our sample is representative of the population and so if I wanted to draw another sample from the population one way I can simulate the population is taking my currently existing sample, duplicate it, you know, a, a billion times, and then and then sample that, okay? And that's equivalent to uh, resampling uh, with replacement. Um, and, you know, I, I showed you some example code on Wednesday, and that works as far as running the bootstrap and doing resamples and things like that. The... Um, um, but uh, but there's a there's a package uh, for R called Library Boot, and it can be used to do uh, bootstrap resampling as well. So um, so that's what we're going to take a look at uh, today, and and I guess you know overall, <laughs> so you know in, in in this class you have to you know code up some stuff like coordinate descent and you know doing some of these things, uh, and and a little bit bit of it is kind of like reinventing the wheel. Um, and the purpose of those exercises are so you like understand how the wheel works, right? But then in in like a re real life scenario where you're just kind of going for the answer, I would say it's better to use some of these existing packages rather than trying to code up your own solution um, because you know the existing packages are a lot of times you know tried and true and tested and um, you know have, have uh, you know kind of nice nice features of them so so just go ahead and use those so we're gonna take a look at this package boot and it uh, and this package provides some useful utilities beyond the basics of just creating a bootstrapped sampling distribution and the function that we use is boot and it can be used for both non-parametric and parametric bootstrap uh, although we're primarily gonna focus just on the non-parametric bootstrap here and you uh, you load it up by calling library boot, and you know you might need to do install that packages boot, um, but again you know you only need to install a package one time. So you know in like your RMD files, you should never put in install that packages um, because that's going to like reinstall the package every single time, right? It's kind of like you only need to buy a book from the bookstore once. And then when you call library, it's just pulling the book book off the bookshelf. So if you want to use the book, you got to call library on it. But you only need to install it one time. You don't need to keep you know repurchasing via the book. All right. If you look for um, help uh, for boot, uh, basically, um, well, this this gets output uh, from thing uh, from the help file. But this is the uh, the usage, and you'll see you know there's you know, three parts, data, statistic, R, these don't have defaults, so you have to provide those. And then everything else, the sim simulation, S-type, strata, L, all of these things have default values. And, um, and, uh, and, and basically you don't have to s supply th these things. Um, it boot allows for uh, parallel computing, so if, you know, if your processor, so depending on uh, you know what kind of computer you have. You can set up kind of like multi-core setups where you have um, you know parallel tasks going on. If you're going to do some kind of something computationally heavy, but uh, it requires a little bit of extra setup. So the default is no, and you probably don't have to wait too long unless you're doing something you know enormously huge. 
Um, but anyway, th this is the description. It says um, boot will generate our bootstrap replicates, R being um, a number, not like R the programming language, but a generate like you know 10,000 bootstrap replicates of a statistic applied to data. And here of a statistic, statistic is a function that you write applied to data, the data that you provide in the function. Both parametric and non-parametric resampling are possible. For the non-parametric bootstrap, possible resampling methods are ordinary bootstrap, balanced bootstrap, antithetic resampling, and permutation. I actually don't even know what these other forms of bootstrap are. I'm just used to ordinary bootstrap. Um, I suppose we could go online, look up what is antithetic resampling, and I'm sure we'll find some kind of answer. But for me, ordinary bootstrap has worked well enough, so I've, I've never bothered with these other ones. But they, they exist. OK. Um, Non-parametric um, multi-sample problem stratified resampling is used. And so um, you can specify um, strata if you need be. So if you're in some kind of situation where, you know, I don't know, you're looking at gender or something like that, you know, you can say, I want to make sure, you know, this prop, uh, proportion appears in my final, um, you know, resample data uh, rather than just leaving it up to chance where you might end up with some kind of Im imbalance. Okay. And uh, so that's what we have. So. The, uh, the three values that we need to supply are data, statistic, and R. So the data um, is going to be the data that gets resampled. That can be a vector, as simple as a vector. Um, it can also be a matrix or a data frame. If it's a matrix or a data frame, then it's, uh, it operates under the assumption that each row each row is uh, one observation, okay, one kind of multivariate observation. And so if that's not the case, if your data is arranged where, you know, you have observations across multiple columns, then you're going to have to, like, pivot your data so that, you know, do a pivot longer so all of the, um, each observation gets its own row, right? So, um, you know, we talked about tidy, tidy data and tidy R, so you might have to pivot your data so that each, each observation gets its own row. Um, that's what you have in data. Uh, statistic, you're going to have to write a function. So this is a function that you have to write. And what this function will do is when you put your data into the function, uh, along with uh, a, a, a vector of indices, and I'll talk about this, it's going to uh, calculate whatever statistic it is that you're looking for. So the function could be simple as, as simple as like a mean function where you plug in um, the data and it's going to calculate the mean of your data. Um, all these functions, though, you can't just use uh, like the function mean. Okay, you have to kind of write um, you have to write a function that takes in two arguments, and uh, and I will show you um, how that works. But um, but you you have to write this function. You're not going to be able to use one of kind of R's. Uh, currently existing functions uh, for, for it, okay? And then R, finally, is the number of bootstrap replicates, usually something like a big number, like 5,000, 10,000, maybe even more for how many um, replicates you want to, uh, to produce. All right, the other, so those are the three um, arguments that you have to provide. The, uh, the other arguments, you can um, specify them as well, but they all have default values associated with them. And um, you know, as far as today's lecture goes, we're just going to cover basically uh, you know the data and the statistic, and I mean, I guess we'll just cover kind of these three things, and then everything else. I'm going to just say, if you're interested, look at the help. You know, read up. You know, look look for help online. Uh, read up about it, and um, uh, you know, <laughs> do do your own kind of reading to uh, to learn more about it. Okay. Um, one thing that Bootstrap does. Um, all right, I, is that okay? Can you not read this anymore? Um, here, just one second. Let me turn off the light. All right. So one one thing um, that Boot does, which is I think kind of clever, is that it resamples indices. It does not resample the actual data directly, and and that's to kind of uh, you know save a little bit on computational power or something. 
So, you know, for example, you can imagine you have this data frame, maybe a thousand observations, but maybe a hundred columns, okay? And if you were to resample that data directly, you know, now you have to kind of work with this large, you know, entity where you're, you know, you have to kind of take into, you know, all, all hundred things. So instead what it's going to do is just going to say, you know what, let's just number the rows one through a thousand. We're going to resample the indices, all right? So I'm going to just draw, you know, row five and row 26 and row 740 and row, you know, and maybe by chance we get row 26 again and, you know, row 85 and row 423 and stuff like that. And, and then it just, uh, you know, with, with R, you can give it um, a vector of um, values. Okay, this is annoying. Um, <laughs> vector of index values, and it's going to um, uh, resample them. All right. You're just going to have to deal with the bright lights here, okay? Um, and so it, it, it resamples um, uh, the index indices, and then it subsets via the data using those indices, okay? Um, so I'm going to show you um, kind of how that works, and and computationally, mathematically, these these are kind of uh, uh, equivalent, right? So here, uh, my population is going to be the 26 letters of the alphabet, okay? And so I think you guys are aware, but maybe not. Um, R kind of has some built-in vectors that are handy. Um, you know, one of uh, some of them being like letters. And you can just, uh, and that's going to be letters, all caps will be 26 capital letters, and then letters, lowercase, will be the 26 lowercase letters. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a other things that you can kind of load up, you know, if you do, uh, what, what, what data is it? You know, there's different data uh, libraries where you can get, like, state names and stuff like that. But anyway, we're just going to do, um, set our population to be the 26 um, lowercase letters. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run sample on the population and so we're going to just draw 10 values from the population with replacement and what I end up getting is I get the letter B, the letter K, Y, O, K, Y, I, U, G, W, okay? And so I've, I've, I've just said, you know, take these 26 letters and draw 10 of them with replacement. Here I'm going to, rather than sample the population directly, I'm going to sample index values, okay? So what I'm going to sample instead is I'm going to sample the values 1 through 26, okay? And I sample um, 1 through 26, I say give me 10 values from the vector 1 through 26, uh, sample with replacement, okay? And when I do that, I get the numbers 2, 11, 25, 15, 11, 25, 9, 21, 7, 23. And we can see if I subset the population using these indices, I get the same values, right? So um, 2 is B, 11 is K, 25 is Y, 15 is O, 11 is K, 25 is Y, and I get the same values, right? So internally, what R is basically doing is it, it's doing the same kind of operation. You know, you set the same seed, you get the same kind of sample results here. Um, and here, I'm sampling indices. And so basically, um, whether it's, you know, values directly, you can say, I want to sample these rows or something like that. And um, and that's kind of how uh, boot will do the uh, the resampling here. All right, let me go ahead and give you your first view quiz answer for today, which is the letter E. E as an elephant is your first view quiz answer. E. And uh, and let's take an example. Okay, we are going to look at the Iris data set. Iris data set, I, I don't know, have you guys seen this before? It's a very popular data set. It's, uh, you know, kind of, it's it's great for toy examples for like classification problems and things like that <laughs> because, um, well, because the data is like so clean and it's like perfectly balanced and things like that. And it, and it's like real data. Um, you know, some, some person went and, uh, looked at iris flowers by hand and measured, you know, the, the width and the length of these things. And, uh, and Ronald Fisher used it back in 1936 uh, when writing a paper on linear discriminant analysis. And, and it's just very nice and clean. You've got these four numeric variables and, um, and the species, you know, you have this categorical variable. And, uh, and the truth is, is, 
you know, real life data is usually much, much more messy. Like, like this is real life data, but like, you know, other data sets are generally much more messy. You, you know, you often have missing values or your, uh, your variables aren't all numeric here. You know, you might have categorical predictors, which uh, come with their own kind of host of uh, prediction challenges. Uh, or, you know, the, your outcome variable that you're trying to predict here is like perfectly balanced. We have 50 Satosa, 50 Versicolor, 50 Virginica. Um, you know, sometimes you might have like 3% category A and 97% category B. And, and that makes it, you know, difficult. Like that, that presents uh, prediction challenges because because if you have honestly if you have uh, imbalanced data where you have three percent a and ninety seven percent b then um, you could write the most worthless prediction algorithm and you would get ninety seven percent accuracy but you just you just predict b for everything no matter the input just predict b and <laughs> and you'll get ninety seven percent so um, and it's almost like once you start trying to predict a your accuracy will probably start dropping. Um, and so, you know, imbalanced data comes with its own kind of uh, challenges. Um, but anyway, this is our uh, the iris data set, and uh, and the variables that we're looking at are sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And um, and so let me just show you a little bit. Here's a diagram of uh, the iris parts. So I I don't know anything about flowers, but you know, if you look at an iris, you look at this and Probably, you know, I would have just said, oh, these are all petals, but they're not, okay? These ones up here, these little ones, these are the petals. And then these bigger things that also look like petals, these are not. These are the sepals, okay? And so um, so when we talk about the petal length and the petal width, that's uh, about these little pieces up here versus these ones over here, which are the sepal length and the sepal width and things like that, okay? And then... And we're looking at, I guess, like three, three species of iris. But apparently there's like thousands of iris species. And, uh, and you, if you just go to the Wikipedia page, like all of these iris species have their own like Wikipedia page. And there's, there's like even more. And so, you know, here is Satosa iris. This is what... Satosa looks like, and oh dear, um, what did we have? I, Virginica look like this, and I guess these are the sepals, and these up here are the petals. You know, you're gonna learn about irises, okay, today. And then this one's Versicolor, and uh, and and this is this is what we have, okay. Uh, but again, you know, lots of other iris species, and you know, you know, I, I don't even know. Iris Lud Lud Ludwigi? I wish we had pictures of these things. Minotaur. Oh wow, look at this. Okay, well anyway, we can we can spend all day looking at iris flowers, but we're not um, not today. <laughs> okay, so anyway, that's that's what we're looking at. So we got sepal length, sepal width. You know, we got some numbers there. Petal length, petal width. You know, smaller for these things, and we got satosa, and then. Um, and so here I calculated some summary statistics. All right, so we said, what's the mean sepal length? Um, Satosa is 5.01. For Versicolor, it's 5.94. Virginica, 6.59. You know, but there's variation, so we can get the standard deviation for the sepal length. And then we could do the same for uh, sepal width, petal length, petal width. Um, all of these things we have. Uh, I calculated the mean and the standard deviation. And again, our, our data set is like kind of perfectly balanced in that we have 50 from, uh, from each, okay? Um, it would be interesting if somebody went and got a whole bunch more irises and we did like the super iris data set with, you know, 100 species and uh, I don't know. <laughs> Who's going to fund that study? But uh, what would it? All right, so here's a pairs plot, right? And so we can kind of plot sepal length versus sepal width versus petal length versus petal width. And, um, and you can kind of see like, uh, you know, as far as like classification goes, like you can kind of just look at pedal length and pedal width and just say like, okay, draw a line here and a draw a line here. And you can s separate the red and the green and the blue um, quite easily. Um, but you know, for some of these other variables, there's, there's a good amount of overlap. So if you say, look at supple length, um, 
you know, for Setosa, the mean is around five, and for the green dots, Versicolor, the mean is around six, okay, 5.94, okay? Um, but there's still quite a bit of overlap between the green and the red and the green dots, right? So you can't just say, okay, if it's over 5.5, it's definitely going to be um, green, and if it's under 5.5, it's definitely going to be red, although, you know, that, that um, you know, you'll probably get it more correct than, than wrong there. And, um, and so, you know, we'll just do a simple hypothesis test, and, and one of the, uh, a very simple one will just be, hey, let's compare the sepal length for two of these species. And so we're going to look at sepal length as setosa and sepal length for versicolor. And I'm going to just say, all right, what is the mean sepal length for setosa? Setosa are the first 50 values in our data set. So I'm just going to do iris dollar sign sepal length first 50. And then I say, what's the uh, sepal length for uh, versicolor, which is the next 50, 51 through 100. And if I do a t-test there, it says the mean of uh, setosa is 5.006. The mean of versicolor is 5.936. So we have a difference of 0.93. And you know, if you compare that to its standard error, we end up getting um, a test statistic of negative 10.5, which is, you know, like ridiculously high, okay? Because you're right, more than two standard errors away is unusual and more than three standard errors away is highly unusual. And here we are at 10 and a half standard errors away. So that's, that's really uh, far, okay? And so we get a p-value of practically zero and saying like, you know, this difference between 5.0 and 5.93 uh, or 5.936, you know, can't be explained by, by randomness alone, okay? So, you know, and that's a t-test and and probably a t-test is fine in this <laughs> scenario here. Um, uh, so uh, so t-test is fine probably because we've got 50, um, 50 observations in each sample. So that's a large sample. So you can safely apply the central limit theorem. Also, if you think about the variables themselves, sepal length and sepal width, or I'm sorry, sepal length, Probably sepal length is something that's going to be approximately normally distributed. I'm not, you know, sometimes in biology, biological situations, you either get something that's generally something that is uh, normally distributed or something that's going to be right skewed uh, often uh, what ends up happening. But um, probably I would venture to say sepal length is probably fairly normal and um, and so, you know, doubly so, we could use the central limit theorem. So t-test is probably fine. But we're going to do a, a bootstrap test just for, for uh, uh, I guess, good measure here. That's what we're, we're learning today. Um, and so one is we'll do a, a bootstrap test, and we will write the code ourselves, and we will resample the values directly. So if the null hypothesis were true, what we're saying is that um, sepal length for setosa and versicolor are coming from the same population, okay? Sepal length for, uh, for both of these things are coming from the same population. And so uh, we're going to say my bootstrap population is just going to be all 100 values thrown together, okay? We're going to just take all 100, the first 100 values, which is setosa and versicolor, we're going to put all 100 of those things into just one uh, population, and then we're going to resample that. All right, so now I'm going to just draw with replacement. I'm going to sample 50 values with replacement from that population, throw those into group A. I'm going to draw another 50 values from the same population, throw those into group B. So we know who ends up in group A and group B is just a result of randomness. And we want to know, okay, what kind of differences could we get from random resampling? Could we get a difference of you know, negative 0.93, right? Because that's what we observed. We observed a difference of 5.0 versus 5.93. We got a difference of negative 0.93. Could we get that kind of difference just from random resampling? Okay, so, so I say, all right, let's do this 10,000 times, and what kind of random differences do we get, all right? So I look at kind of uh, the summary, you know, five number summary of our differences. Most of the time, my random sampling produces a difference of around zero, okay? Mean of 0 0.0002698, which 
uh, make sense. Um, sometimes I get a difference as low as negative 0.7, sometimes I get a difference as high as 0.552. But not once in 10,000 random resamplings did I ever get a difference of 0.93 or higher, okay, or negative 0.93 or more negative, right? So this, these results kind of align with my t-test saying, you know what, here it's saying, you know, the probability of getting a difference of 0.93 by randomness is practically zero, and we're, we're seeing something align here. We're, we said, okay, what kind of differences could I get by randomness, by random resampling, if that null hypothesis were true? And it's saying you might get differences as high as 0.552 or as negative as negative 0.47, but not once do we get a difference of 0.93 and indicating to us that our difference of 0.93 probably is not a result of uh, randomness, but rather something else, that the two populations actually are different, that they're not coming from the same population. Um, so that's that would be a bootstrap test, and that would, that would be good. What I want to show you is, okay, can we run the same thing, but rather than resampling the population of values directly, let's resample the indices, okay? And this feels a little bit awkward, but, um, but this is how the function boot uh, operates, is it resamples indices. So here, what I'm going to do is um, my index, okay, I'm going to resample the index 1 through 100, because my data lies in the first 100 rows of the, of the data frame. So I'm going to take the indices 1 through 100, and I'm going to... Uh, sample 100 values with replacement, okay? And once I do that, I subset the iris data to just those 100 resampled rows, okay? So I might get like row 15 and row 26 and row 75 and row 26 again and row 88. And, uh, and so I'm going to just uh, subset the iris data set to those resampled indices. And then, um, and then I put the first 50 values into group A and the second 50 values into group B. And again, who ends up in group A and who ends up in group B is just a result of kind of this resampling process, this random resampling process. We calculate the difference between group A and the difference between and mean of group B, and we store those, and we, uh, and we look at those results, and we get the same results, okay? Mean difference of around 0, 0.00, you know, of around zero, as high as 0.552, as negative as 0.47, I can say, hey, are these results the same? And they are. The, the differences I calculated here using this sampling process and the differences I calculated here using this, this sampling process, they are identical, okay? Even though they feel different, here I called for, you know, 100 values uh, sampled with replacement and it gives me the same things here. So, um, so that's how resampling the indices work. And so when you use uh, the boot function, you have to write your own function called statistic, okay? You have to write a statistic function. It, I mean, it doesn't have to be called statistic, but it gets passed in as the statistic argument. And this, that function that we write always takes in, two, uh, takes in two arguments, the data and the indices, okay? And what function boot does is function boot will perform the resampling of indices all right, so it does that part. It passes those resampled indices to your function that you wrote, and your function is going to then calculate whatever statistic it is that you want and return that, okay? So what we want to do in our thing is just calculate what is the difference between, uh, I guess, the sepal length of, I guess, the 50 setosa flowers versus the mean sepal length of the 50 versicolor flowers, but really just kind of group A and group B. So um, so this is what a function that we could use might look like, right? So this function takes into account two arguments, data and index. Data is going to be the iris data set, and the index will be the resampled indices that get passed to us. Our function does not need to perform the resampling of indices. Uh, library boot is going to do that, okay? Or function boot will do the resampling of indices. Uh, what we need to do, though, is we take the random indices that get pa passed to us, and we will subset our data using those random indexes, okay? So here I'm going to take data, I subset it to those random indexes, 
and I store that as resampled underscore data. And then I'm going to take the first 50 values. I'm going to do uh, resample data dollar sign sepal length for the first 50 values and put that into group A. Resample data for the uh, next 50 values, put that into group e B. Calculate the mean of group A and the mean of group B, and that's going to be my difference, and that is going to be the value that gets returned. Okay? Now, I could have written this you know, a little bit more concisely. I don't need to store it as difference and then return difference, but just kind of for clarity, that's, uh, that's what I wrote. So we're going to calculate the mean of group A, subtract off the mean of group B, and then return that value. Okay, so that's what the difference function is going to do for us. And so once we've written this difference function, okay, and again, your function takes, in, takes two arguments, data and index, then we, uh, we run um, the function boot on it, okay? So we run boot, we give it the data that we want to resample, and in our case, we only want to look at the first 100 rows of iris because that has the uh, Setosa and Versicolor um, species in there. Then and we calculate the statistic, and then we ca uh, we say how many um, replicates do we want to run? Okay. Uh, so we use um, um, so we we do that. Okay. And uh, and again, this is a function that we've written here. All right. So we run that. We store the output into boot underscore results. And boot underscore results is this huge list, okay? List of 12, and there's a few things. One is gonna be um, T0, uh, which is kind of our, I guess, our observed difference, all right? The, uh, you know, the difference between 5.006 and negative 5.936, which was um, what we got here, okay? We get a difference of negative 0.93, that's kind of the, the first value there. Uh, these are the, Differences that we got by random resampling, they're all stored in T. And because we had 10,000 replicates, this, uh, this matrix T has 10,000 values in it, okay? Um, R is how many replicates we did, and then there's other values that it stores, right? The actual data, the seeds, and all of these other things um, that it might keep track of, okay? Um, so the individual bootstrap results that we got are stored in... Um, dollar sign t and if I ask for a summary on dollar sign t you know we got slightly different results but again uh, values right around 0 is my mean okay my largest was 0.5 my most negative was negative 0.434 and so not once in our 10,000 replicates did we get a difference of 0.93 indicating that you know what, what we observed was not a result of randomness um, we can calculate an empirical p-value at least an estimate of our, our p-value by kind of looking at that results uh, uh, in that vector dollar sign t, okay? And so our observed difference was the difference between 5.006 and negative 5.936. So we got a difference of negative 0.93. And again, that, uh, that difference is also stored in dollar sign uh, t0, okay? This dollar sign t0 is uh, the result of not resampling the indices, but just passing the index 1 through 100. So if we pass 1 through 100, there's no res resampling there. It, uh, it just calculates, okay, what's the mean of the first 50? What's the mean of the second 50? Which would perfectly segregate the data into Setosa versus Versicolor. And um, it calculates the mean of the Setosa, mean of Versicolor, and says, oh, you know what, the difference is negative 0.93. And then we can say, okay, well, out of 10,000 uh, randomizations, how many times did we get uh, um, a result where it was 0.93 or greater? Um, the answer to that is zero. It happened zero times out of 10,000. So our estimate of our p-value is basically zero, that this, this just never happened out of 10,000. Now, does that mean it's impossible? You know, we don't like to use that word impossible, but it just means it's very unlikely and it didn't happen once in 10,000 times, right? It's kind of like, is, you know, can you flip a coin 100 times and get 100 heads in a row? Um, not, it's not impossible, but it's also so incredibly unlikely that we're gonna say, I don't, you know, I don't think this is gonna happen, right? And we did it 10,000 times and it, it didn't happen once in 10,000, okay? Uh, 
there is a boot, uh, the bootstrap results comes with its own plot function. And so you can just do plot on bootstrap results, on boot results. And, uh, and it gives you this plot right here, okay? And so this gives you a histogram of the uh, randomized, you know, results for T. And so, you know, if the null hypothesis were true, we're expecting differences of zero, and that's what we see. We see a distribution of T, um, you know, the, that um, these differences, we get uh, most of them are around zero, sometimes a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower. Um, and so we see this kind of this distribution here. Uh, what we see, this dotted line over here, this dotted line represents the difference in our observed data. Our observed data had a difference of negative 0.93. And we can see when we compare that to the sampling distribution of um, randomized differences that we get, we can see that this is like way out here, okay? It's very far away from kind of the sampling distribution, indicating that, you know, to get this result, it's not going to happen just by random, random resampling, okay? There's also a, a QQ norm, a quantile plot of the values of T, and we see they are normally distributed, um, and that's expected because you know, as we said, our sample is pretty large, the population is probably close to normal, and so the central limit theorem applies, and so we would expect our sampling distribution to follow the normal distribution. In some cases, your, you know, your random samples won't, won't be normal, and, you know, having this plot actually won't be very useful, because you might have, you know, some highly skewed data or something like that, where you're not expecting your, um, your random resamples to be normal. Uh, but but that's uh, plot.boot that uh, that gets provided. Here I created a density plot of basically this uh, T right here, and uh, and the bottom got cut off, but it you know looks looks kind of normal is uh, is what what this, what this thing shows. Okay. Um, the library boot also comes with additional functions. One of the functions says, hey, we can make confidence intervals. We can make confidence intervals. Um, using our results. Now, if I try to use the confidence interval for my results over here, uh, I actually had encounter an error. And that was because my uh, observed difference was so unusual, so extreme, that, um, um, you know, we, we got a p-value of zero, right? Empirical p-value of zero, not one of my random resamplings ended up um, kind of like my observed difference. So it says bootstrap variances are needed and basically we, we have like no variance over here. So, so we actually end up getting um, a zero here. There's a, there's a little tutorial that you can read uh, on the DataCamp site about bootstrap and, uh, and it goes into some details about some of these different confidence intervals. So, um, so I'm gonna kind of switch my example a little bit um, and, and one of the thing about boot, uh, library boot is you know, that statistic function that we pass can be as complicated or as simple as we want it to be. So if we wanted to say, hey, what is the sampling distribution of, say, uh, the correlation uh, between some of these variables, um, we can do that, right? So here, I'm going to say, what is, is there a correlation between sepal length and sepal width, okay? And if I take all 150 observations, so all three species, Setosa, Versicolor, Virginica, and I say, is there a correlation between sepal length and sepal width? I actually end up getting um, slightly negative correlation, um, which might be surprising. And, and so let me just show you kind of what's going on here. And, and this is one of those uh, situations where you you know we say is there a correlation between sepal length and sepal width, and and I drew a little a little diagram here. But if you look at say one of the species, is there a correlation between sepal length and sepal width? We'd say yeah, there's definitely positive correlation. As the sepals get longer, they also get wider, um, just basically bigger, right? Um, and if you look at the green, there's positive correlation. If you look at the blue, there's positive correlation. But overall. Is there a correlation? The correlation ends up being negative, and you kind of have the you know sometimes this happens where for one group you have positive correlation, you know, in another group you have positive correlation, in another group you have positive correlation, and you might have something kind of like this. But overall, as a whole, there's like negative correlation, 
and and stuff like that happens and this is one of those examples where you have kind of positive correlation individually for each species but as a whole you end up getting negative correlation so that's, uh, you know that we're not actually investigating that particular thing but here we want to say all right if these are the 150 values that we have in our uh, population you know what kind of uh, you know how much variation could there be just kind of from random resampling right so if if this if we're going to take our 150 observations and say this is uh, representative of the entire population let's make the entire population based on this and we're going to say hey what kind of correlation values can we get from random resampling okay and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a function here I'm going to call it correlation and it takes in two arguments data and indices and what I do is I'm going to subset my data using those indices that's going to I'm going to call that resampled data and I'm going to say all right based on the resampled data what kind of correlation will I get between column one and column two which is supple length and supple width okay and so this is going to you know this is a simple function but basically we're saying if this if this represents kind of my entire population by random sampling could I get a correlation that's positive you know what what kind of correlation values can I get so I do this and I say all right do this 10,000 times resample the entire iris data set um, calculate the correlation statistic and um, and this is what we get okay so our t0 okay which is the the value from our actual data is negative 0.118 okay or negative 0.1175698 if we keep more decimals um, and then you know we did 10,000 replicates and we can see yeah you know sometimes we get more negative things more positive you know some positive values and we can kind of uh, look at this right so our summary values we go anywhere from somewhere to somewhere okay um, and with this we can calculate um, confidence intervals so here I can do boot.ci say give me confidence intervals for bootstrap results okay and and this it gives me um, some confidence intervals and there's there's four different confidence intervals that it gives us it says the normal confidence interval the basic confidence interval the percentile confidence interval and the BCA some kind of accelerated confidence interval so the normal I think uses like the normal distribution and the percentile uses like the actual results from the, the thing there is like subtle and nuanced difference between these things I'm not a hundred percent sure like uh, if, if it really matters which one you use <laughs> okay um, it's kind of like yeah there's a few different methods I mean what we see is most of these things like kind of are in close agreement with each other and um, uh, which I guess is a, a good sign um, but yeah you know there's there's some slight differences um, I don't know if they really make a huge difference um, you know these are some of the kind of the definition differences between these confidence intervals and I guess I guess they matter a little bit, but also um, I, don't, I don't know if it makes a huge difference. It's a little bit like in linear regression, you know, to evaluate your model, you have like the BIC and the AIC, and those formulas are are very very similar, right? One has is like uh, the penalty factor for like more variables is two, and the other one is like the penalty factor is like log of like your number of variables and stuff like that or something and and I think the BIC punishes more complicated models a little bit more heavily than the AIC um, but you know a lot of times they kind of agree as you know like which one's the best performing model most of the time they come fairly close to agreement you know um, maybe a slight difference in terms of like maybe having including one more predictor or not um, I don't know okay so you know, should you be aware of these things and how much does it affect your decisions? I I don't know if your decision should be greatly influenced by just like one subtle difference here. How many view quiz answers did I give you? Just one. Okay, let me just go ahead and give you your last two. Last two view quiz answers today are the letters C and B. C as in cat 
uh, breaking my heart here. C as, C as in cat and B as in bear. So C and B are your last two view quiz answers. Um, that's uh, that's what we have there. Okay. Um, so all right. So yeah, I'll just I'll just read off what I have written on the slide here. So the normal confidence interval uh, uses the normal distribution. Basically, uh, you're going to like 1.96 uh, times your standard error, uh, you know, estimated from the bootstrap results, and you know, you know that assumes central limit theorem kind of applies. Um, the percentile confidence interval says, okay, well, we did 10,000 of these things, so we have kind of a sampling distribution here, right? And then it says, okay, take the two and a half percentiles, which would be the 250th, and the 97 and a half percentile, which would be the 9,750th of these things, and say, okay, make a confidence interval based on this and that, right? This one's actually for a different statistic, but basically line them up and take your two and a half and 97 and a half percentile. Uh, the basic CI, what is this? Computes the differences between the results of each bootstrap replicate and T0, and it reports percentiles based on that, so I don't know, something. And then the BCA is the bias corrected accelerated interval from BFRON, and you know, they wrote a academic journal article about it, um, but I, I don't know exactly what the implications of this, although this one seems to be the most different of the uh, of the four confidence intervals. But but overall, all of our confidence intervals are kind of in agreement, showing that it is possible to get zero as a kind of correlation. So, you know, does our data provide evidence that the correlation in the population is significantly different from zero? And the answer, I think, would be like, you know, it is possible that there's no correlation uh, if you look at all of the species across the board. Um, whereas, you know, if you probably look at one species, you'll probably find um, positive correlation and things like that. Um, but anyway, uh, that's all I have for today's lecture. So we'll go ahead and end here. Um, next week is week 10. I have, you know, just kind of maybe like one, one and a half lectures planned. So I might give you a day off uh, next week if that's okay. Uh, I don't know if anybody's going to feel like they're not getting their money's worth uh, by having three full lectures during week 10. But, uh, but we could probably use a little bit of rest, right? So, um, so anyway, uh, have a great weekend, and we will see you on Monday.